Good morning. Um, I am Ward 4 Council Member Janice Lewis George, Chair of the Committee on Facilities and Family Services. It is 9.35 a.m. on Friday, April 5th, 2024. We are holding this hearing via a hybrid format with public and government witnesses testifying via Zoom or here in room 500 of the John A. Wilson Building. This hearing is also being broadcast live on my website at janiceward4.com backslash live. Here's some brief reminders about the committee's protocols for witnesses participating virtually today. All witnesses participating in the Zoom webinar are currently listed as attendees. When it's your turn to join a panel for testimony, I will call your name and a member of my staff will promote you to be a panelist. Um, if you wish to activate your video while you testify, which is preferred, you need to click the button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen that looks like a video camera. Representatives of bona fide organizations will be given five minutes to testify. Unaffiliated public witnesses will be given three minutes as well. When your time is up, I will ask that you please conclude your remarks so that we can stay on schedule. We will be calling up witnesses in two panels and council members present will have 10 minutes to ask each panel questions. If you have any technical issues during the hearing, please notify my committee uh, via the Q&A function in Zoom or by sending an email to facilities at dccouncil.gov. All testimony and pre-hearing documents that have been submitted are available now on the council's hearing management system website. Witnesses are reminded to please submit a written copy of your testimony for the record by uploading your testimony to the hearing management system. Uh, the record for this hearing closes at 5 p.m. on Friday, April 12th. With that, today we are holding a public hearing on B25-694, the Early Childhood Facilities Preservation and Expansion Act of 2024. B25694 was introduced by Councilmember Brianna Doe and co-introduced by Chairman Mendelson on February 9th, 2024. The bill grants the mayor authority to enter into negotiations for lease or acquisitions of certain properties for the purposes of preserving and expanding early childhood education facilities. I'd like to start by thanking Councilmember Deneau for introducing this important legislation, as well as other public witnesses for their work in advocating for our community. When I learned of, of the instability surrounding the futures of Bancroft and Rosemount, I knew that we had to hold a hearing as soon as possible. Both these educational institutions are integral to the community and cater to often underserved populations. Students, families, and educators deserve stability and continu continuity within their communities and schools. I'm hopeful that this hearing will give us a chance to flesh out what we know uh, and what comes next. I look forward to hearing from and engaging with all of our witnesses today. At this time, I'd like to recognize and thank my colleague, Councilman Rideau, for joining me here today and recognize her for an opening statement. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ward 1 Councilmember Brianna Doe, and I'm pleased to be here with you all this morning for a public hearing on my bill, 25-694, the Early Childhood Facilities Preservation and Expansion Act of 2024. Thank you to Councilmember Lewis George for recognizing the significance of this legislation and holding a public hearing during a very busy budget season. And a special thank you to all the parents, advocates, and school leaders, and the community at large for your tireless work and advocacy on behalf of our children. It's been wonderful to see how the community has rallied behind Bancroft Elementary and the Rosemount Center. It's because of your passion that we have made so much positive progress towards potential solutions for both schools. When I introduced this bill, my goal was to advocate on behalf of the two unique and important institutions that mean so much and do so much for our city. Bancroft Elementary functions not only as a successful school, but as a community pillar and safe space for children and youth. Kids from across the street, the ward, and the city gather to play soccer on the field when they could otherwise be engaged in harmful activities. It also offers a rare individualized education program for English language learners and often overlooked population of students. As a longtime supporter of early childhood education and a mother of two young kids, I understand the positive impact of early childhood education facilities on our children and our communities. And when an ECE facility offers affordable, high quality services to a diverse population of families like Rosemount does, it's crucial that we do everything we can to fight for its future. It's vital that we not only maintain but expand equitable access to ECE, especially for populations who have received historic underinvestment. It's my hope we can explore and exhaust every possible alternative to the current solutions being offered for Bancroft and Rosemount. 
Finding viable options will benefit not only these institutions, but all schools in the area and improve the feeder pattern for wards one, three, and four. I look forward to hearing directly from the community about the importance of Bancroft and Rosemount, receiving progress updates, exchanging information, and evaluating our next steps. Given the absence of a government witness, I plan to send the Office of Deputy Mayor for Education and the Department of General Services post-hearing questions based on what we learned today. Both agencies have also submitted written testimony for the record. My hope is that from their responses in our discussion here today, we can explore potential solutions and avenues for funding. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from our first uh, panel of witnesses. Uh, Jamie Barden, co-chair of Bancroft Annex Working Group. Uh, Monseret Gil Fernandez. Patricio Zambrano. Mark Simon, Bancroft LSAT. Omar Parhu, Commissioner ANC 1D05. Good morning, uh, Mr. Barden, I see you, and you can begin your testimony when ready. My name is Jamie Barden. I am a Bancroft parent and the co-chair of the Bancroft Annex Working Group. Bancroft Elementary has a serious and growing overcapacity issue. An off-site expansion of classrooms by purchasing space is the only sustainable solution to preserve this thriving bilingual school. So I thank Councilmember Nadeau and Chair Mendelson for introducing the Early Childhood Facilities Expansion Act of 2024, and Councilmember Lewis George always, this time in this case, for hosting us. Bancroft provides a welcoming cultural environment for every child in the neighborhood. So it's no surprise that more families want to join our school. Enrollment has grown at a consistent rate year after year of about 49 students for four years running. I have, because I'm a professor, I have a graph. <laughs> we need to prepare more space because the school's future growth already lives in the neighborhood, including my infant son, Felix. The overcapacity issue is already interfering with learning. Our library has already been squeezed like a trash compactor in Star Wars to make two classrooms. This year, we lost our science classroom and all of the lab equipment that the PTO raised money to provide. Monse, our, one of our amazing kindergarten teachers, will talk further about these impacts. As part of the boundary study, the Deputy Mayor for Education conducted an exhaustive search of potential solutions that would avoid having to seek off-campus space. Here's a quick rundown of these based on the DME statement for this hearing. Shrinking the inbound area of the school only decreases enrollment by 34 students, which doesn't put a dent in the 100 student overcapacity expected next year. So the DME dropped this proposal. DCPS looked into expanding Bancroft's building. They explored bringing an outdoor classroom indoors, for example, but this was ultimately rejected. Finally, the DME has kept open two solutions that are disastrous. One is to cut pre-K classes and the other is to put trailers on the school soccer field. Later speakers will address these in detail. I will just share and amplify the voice of Principal Morales. She stated that these losses would fall most heavily on low-income Spanish-speaking populations in the neighborhood. The current legislation is a necessary first step towards a sustainable Bancroft. The only long-term solution is the purchase of an annex building for pre-K and kindergarten. In fact, there is a rare opportunity right now and in Mount Pleasant itself. The Henderson buildings at Park and 16th are deeply discounted. This former charter school has outdoor space and a large uh, footprint large enough for Bancroft's future growth. It will require renovation, but after that, it could house Bancroft Annex and other institutions that would serve families in need. DGS and DCPS conducted a thorough site visit of Henderson buildings back on January 31st. However, 
they have refused to share specifics of what they found after repeated requests. The DME has also shared ridiculous timeframes about how long that process, progress would take without any real support. The mayor's budget only came out two days ago, so the specifics of funding need to be established. That said, projects like the purchase of the Henderson buildings receive funding every year, including tight budget years. I look forward to working with Councilmember Nadeau and Chair Mendelson and the rest of the council to secure funds for this purchase. And I welcome engagement from uh, Chair of this committee, uh, Lewis George. A short-term off-campus uh, classroom space is needed as well while the long-term space is renovated. This could be a lease at the former charter school space above the CVS, or it could be the Sharp Health swing space, or it could be working out a lease agreement of some kind with Rosemount for pre-K classroom space. For now, I ask that the city council pass this legislation for the mayor to negotiate acquiring the Henderson buildings as an annex for Bancroft. In doing so, the council would show that they value public education and culturally welcoming schools. Thank you and I welcome questions and I'll also stick around uh, through the second panel as well if there's any follow-up. Great, thank you so much. And next we will hear from Monserrat Gil Fernandez um, and we have a interpreter prepared to assist. Good morning. Me llamo Montserrat Hill. Soy maestra de kinder en Bancroft. En 2014 llegué a Washington DC y desde entonces trabajo en Bancroft. Lo que más me gusta de esta comunidad es su comun es de esta escuela es su comunidad diversa y bilingüe. Desde que Bancroft sobrepasó su aforo de estudiantes, una de mis preocupaciones es la capacidad de la cafetería para alimentar y sentar a todos los estudiantes. Actualmente, el grado de kinder tiene que hacer dos turnos para usar el recreo y para comer, porque no cabemos todos juntos en un solo turno. Los turnos de comida son de 30 minutos, donde casi 70 estudiantes de entre 5 y 6 años necesitan pasar por la cafetería y comer en ese tiempo. Cada año a los maestros se nos complica más la organización de eventos escolares en los que invitamos a las familias, como la Noche Internacional, Festival de Poesía, Concierto de la Paz, graduaciones, etc. Ya que sobrepasa con creces el aforo donde se celebra el evento, sin mencionar el peligro que conlleva si ocurre alguna emergencia. Con el sobrepaso del aforo, los salones son bastante numerosos. Actualmente en Kinder tenemos clases de 25 estudiantes cada una. Esto impacta directamente no solo en, en el aprendizaje de los estudiantes, sino en su seguridad, ya que la probabilidad de que ocurra un incidente con nuestros estudiantes aumenta al tener un salón tan numeroso, de niños tan pequeños. Esto impacta en el agotamiento mental de los maestros y como consecuencia en su salud, tanto física como mental, razón que dificulta la retención de maestros en la escuela. Desde mi punto de vista, el uso de los trailers en la escuela no sería una solución, al contrario, dificultaría aún más la capacidad dentro de la escuela y el uso de sus espacios. Con ello, aumentaría más el número de nuestros estudiantes. Se reduciría el espacio para jugar. Y pongo en duda la capacidad de las mesas de la cafetería para dar cabida a todos los estudiantes. El año pasado, el 95% de los estudiantes que venían de pre-K en Bancroft terminaron en kinder a nivel de grado en español. 
Y eso es debido a la continuidad no solo académica, sino también del idioma que reciben los estudiantes que asisten a Pre-K en Bancro. Si quitamos Pre-K, no estamos ofreciendo el apoyo a las familias con bajo recurso económico. Es muy importante mantener la equidad de nuestra población. Además, si queremos intervenir a temprana edad, necesitamos mantener los salones de Pre-K. Teniendo el edificio, el edificio anexo, podemos proveer el apoyo y tendremos el espacio suficiente para servir a nuestros estudiantes con salones más reducidos y ofrecer así a, nuestro, a nuestros estudiantes la experiencia emocional y académica que se merecen. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Please stay on for questions at the end. Next, we will hear from Patricio Zambrano, co-chair of Bancroft Annex Working Group. Thank you, Chairwoman. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Um, I am part of the Annex Working Group, and I am also proudly part of a much larger advocacy group that has come together and grown over the last half year to ensure that Bancroft, our wonderful neighborhood, and dual language school continues to thrive and serve its diverse communities. I think you have heard from my fellow panelists and advocates, and you will continue to hear about it, how overcrowding at Bancroft is an issue that cannot be ignored and can deeply affect our students and teachers and beyond, as I'll explain. It is a problem that could have been foreseen through an earlier planning processes 10 years ago, but wasn't. And now yet again, we find ourselves at a critical crossroads. It will continue to get worse without action, since Bancroft will continue to attract new students. Even today, from unexpected places, our registrar tells us that inbound students from Bethune School, who do not want to come into their new swing space, have already enrolled at Bancroft. So this is things that haven't even been modeled that we know are coming. It is an issue that thus cannot be solved through short-term patches, and certainly not without terrible impacts, such as the proposed trailers that would do away with, the one, of, with one of the most vibrant a universally accessible, safe public spaces at the school, and indeed the entire neighborhood, the soccer field. My colleague's testimony should illustrate how important it is to take bold and positive action now. Now, I want to complement what they have said and will say by focusing on two issues. The link between annex, the annex building and early childhood education, and related to that, the importance of the annex to my community, the Latino community. My family is one of so many who deeply understand how dual language education is at the heart of Bancroft's success. This obviously, as Monsi alluded to, starts in pre-K, which every year welcomes numerous Latino students from both inbound and out of bounds, whose very presence throughout the years ensures that dual language works for all of the students. I want to emphasize to you today how securing an annex in the Henderson buildings is actually securing the stability of ECE and by extension, the success of Bancroft as a dual language school. Pre-K and kindergarten would be the classes moving to the annex, given the very specific requirements these have. To name a few, ECE has a different curriculum and it requires different student-teacher ratios. And like older grades, young children do not use the cafeteria at the same time as all others. Play areas have different setups and so on. You must know that the annex, a permanent answer to the challenge of overcapacity, has important positive implications then for current and future Latino families who make up the majority of ECE and whose diversity contributes to Bancroft's greatness. Now associated with this, there is another important connection between the Annex and the Latino community, which is ultimately about equity. equity. Early childhood education, as you very well know, is so much more than just education. Bancroft's ECE is also about families, Latino families, social, mental, and economic well-being. When many of us send our children to preschool each day, it is not just for what they will learn, but also because we know they will be part of a strong support infrastructure. Basic need, special needs will be met, nutrition and safety will be guaranteed, and families therefore become part of a nurturing and healthy community. And please note that all of the wraparound services that begin in pre-K last throughout elementary school and have a long lasting impact and effect on Latino families. And this is part of the continuity that Monse just spoke of. 
It is something that only a DCPS institution, a public school, can do right and in a sustained manner. And this is different from pre-K that other entities can provide. It is no secret that in this budget cycle, early childhood would suffer. I find it my duty to highlight how the annex can, does make a positive impact. Yes, very much in terms of overcrowding, but also in terms of how it sustains CCE, its wraparound services, and how it ensures that Latino families can help secure the long-term well-being of their children and their households. We should not have to choose between pre-K, the key to bankers' diversity, and that bonds us together, and our school's green space where children of all ages and backgrounds can come together and engage in safe activities and play. Please make room for the annex, for it will ensure that Bancroft and the Latino communities can stay together and can stay strong. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Mark Simon. Good morning, Mark. Good to see you. Good morning, Janice. Um, <clears throat> my name is Mark Simon. I'm uh, the community representative on the Bancroft LSAT, recruited for that role by the Mount Pleasant Village. I live uh, just two blocks from the school, and I've uh, lived there for most of my 51 years in DC. My daughter went through DCPS from kindergarten through 12th grade. Thank you, uh, Council Member Nadeau, for the legislation requesting the mayor find a facility fix for the Rosemount catastrophe and the annex for Bancroft's overcrowding. And thank you, Council Member Lewis George, for this hearing. And thank you, Jamie, uh, Patricio, and Monse uh, for making a lot of the points that I wanted made much better than I could make them. <laughs> um, the uh, the good news is that Bancroft is a shiny success story, and so, for that matter, is Rosemount. It's not just an excellent, well-run neighborhood school beloved by the Mount Pleasant community, but it's a dual-language school meeting the needs of a diverse student population, 65% of whom are native Spanish speakers. Uh, I, I think about 35% of the school are uh, white and English speakers. Um, it's so beloved as a school in our neighborhood that uh, a year and a half ago, uh, we were able to respond to a dangerous traffic situation in front of the school by getting the Department of Transportation to close the street to traffic by recruiting 40 resident volunteers, eight each day, all year long, to man the barricades blocking the street in front of the school for traffic um, for the hours of student arrival and departure. Half the volunteers are not even parents. I wrote an article about it in Greater Greater Washington's online publication, and I included the link in my uh, written testimony. The school is a gem to preserve as is. So it's good news for DCPS that Bancroft is greatly overcrowded, but it's a problem to be fixed. And the only solution, as Jamie and others have said, is an annex for the school. The school has an enrollment of 769 this year, 110% over capacity. Next year, it'll be 115% over capacity. It's projected to grow by at least 50 students each year or 49, as, as Jamie said, um, for the next decade. That's a good thing. The school is a success story. The alternative to Bancroft getting an annex, leased or purchased, or both, short-term and long-term, would mean two trailers occupying the soccer field and cuts to pre-K classes, which are essential to preserving the mix of Spanish-speaking kids in our bilingual program. Both would dramatically change the nature of the school. The soccer field is well used all day, after school and on weekends. Monse, who spoke uh, earlier, made the case better than I could. During the day, uh, school recess for this overcrowded school particularly impacts the easiest students. In a neighborhood without other recreational space for kids, the field is used for the school's DC scores program, for bake sales, Christmas tree sales, 
and by the community all weekend for regular soccer and exercise classes for young people. Trailers covered, covering the field cannot be the default solution. There has to be an annex beginning in 2025 and for the long term. The DC, uh, sorry, the uh, Deputy Mayor for Education uh, and his staff have been great, I have to say, as has Council Member Nadeau. They paid very close attention and listened to the community. It turns out that the knee jerk solution of changing the boundaries not only would not have solved the problem, but it would have particularly impacted Spanish dominant families. And now the other knee jerk default response of trailers and eliminating pre-K must also be ruled out. All the due diligence by the deputy mayor and others will have been for naught if the first if the last step of obtaining real estate for the annex is not completed. 15 years ago, the city sold and gave away school buildings under Michelle Rhee. It's time to reverse that mistake, respond to the healthy demand and fix the problem. The real estate fix will have a budget impact. There needs to be language in the master facilities plan and the mayor's budget to solve this little crisis. Thank you for this well-timed hearing aimed at preserving the good news of what's working in DCPS. Sorry, I ran, ran over a little bit. All good. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, we will hear from Omar Bar Barbu. Bar help me. <laughs> Barbu. <laughs> it's okay. That H throws everyone off. Um, so good morning, Chairperson Louis George and Councilmember Nadeau. Thank you for convening today's hearing and giving us the opportunity to speak about the need to preserve early childhood education in our community. My name is Omar Parbu, and I'm testifying on behalf of the Advisory Neighborhood Commission in 1D, the proud home of Bancroft Elementary School and the Rosemount Center. Today, you have and will continue to hear from our community on both institutions, but I want to use the next few minutes to focus on how an annex is the best and only solution to overcrowding at Bancroft. First, I want to express deep gratitude to Councilmember Nadeau for the bill that we're discussing today. The council member has been a partner and advocate for our community throughout the boundary study process and has shown true leadership in our moment of need by sending a letter to the mayor and about our impending childhood education crisis and introducing this bill to offer a real path forward. On February 20th, ANC-1D unanimously passed a resolution in support of the bill and reiterated the call to the mayor and the council to take the necessary actions to secure an annex for Bancroft, as well as to maintain Rosemount's uh, current operations. Attached to that resolution were over 60 personal letters from the community sharing why Bancroft matters to them and what would be lost if we didn't expand the school's capacity. I'd like to spotlight some of their voices today. First, Roberto Ramirez Arias writes, we are a new family with two young children, six and four years old, new immigrants to this great country since two years ago. I'm from Honduras and my wife is from Poland and a substitute teacher in Bancroft Elementary and actively engages in various community activities. We've grown to love our community here at Mount Pleasant and appreciate the great job that Bancroft Elementary does. Not fully addressing overcapacity capacity will mean that Bancroft will have to reduce current school resources and programs to accommodate inbound students in K through five, compromising the quality of the school's programming and education. Bancroft has already cut many resources, including library space and the science classroom. Next year, the school will lose parent uh, and intervention rooms that support students with acute needs. Bancroft's remaining PK-3 and likely the PK-4 classroom will eventually need to be cut. PK is essential to preserving Bancroft's dual language Spanish speaking student body and provide families in need with wraparound family services. Bancroft currently provides some of the few Spanish language special education standalone classrooms in DC, serving students from across the city. This critical service would also be in jeopardy if overcrowding is not addressed. In response to some of the non-annex solutions that were initially considered, another neighbor, Tara Barampur writes, I'm a decade long resident of Mount Pleasant, a single parent of an elementary school student with deep connections to the neighborhood community and a strong commitment to the bilingual education path my fellow parents and I have embraced. I consider my neighbors on Harvard, Hobart and Irving Street to be an integral part of our community fabric. Children walk to school together and parents and neighbors support each other through school events. Cutting these streets off from Bancroft Elementary School and bilingual education would tear the fabric and damage the close-knit school community we have all worked so hard to build. The strength of Mount Pleasant as a diverse and cohesive neighborhood and the success of Bancroft as a local public school have led to overcrowding at the school. 
There is, however, an excellent solution to this overcrowding, an annex building that will absorb some classrooms currently housed at Bancroft. And finally, because of time, I'll share one last excerpt from Michael Hastings Black. My wife and I moved to Mount Pleasant so that we could send our son to Bancroft Elementary. My wife is an immigrant from South America and educating our family in Spanish is deeply important to us. The proposed changes to the school boundary would have a negative impact, not only in our family, but many other Spanish speaking households in our surrounding blocks and the fabric of our neighborhood. The result of investing in an ECE building as a long-term solution to Bancroft's overcrowding would be growth in the DCPS student population and higher quality bilingual education for more students. The alternative would be to reduce Bancroft's programming quality and create divisions within our tight-knit community. We have never been more united as a community and supportive of our neighborhood school. These messages and the, one, the testimonies you heard so far make clear that Bancroft is a DCPS success story worth preserving. You've now heard the arguments, the numbers, and the personal appeals for why an annex is the only path forward. I understand that acquiring an annex is costly, but what the city has in Bancroft is priceless. I'm looking forward to this bill moving out of committee and being approved by the council. And I would just wanna say thank you again for all the work and support and time you've devoted to this. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we will now have a round of questions um, and we're gonna start with Council Member Doe for a 10 minute round of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my questions will be for the entire panel. Not everybody has to answer everyone, but I do want to give people the chance to, to weigh in. Um, for the record, can anyone provide me with additional background regarding what options have already been explored and exhausted prior to the request for an annex? That's pr probably most relevant to my testimony. Um, I went through um, quite a few of them and sorry, I didn't upload it uh, as soon as I might have. Um, the one that um, uh, the one that I didn't mention, uh, but that the deputy mayor for education said that they literally did not consider is also really important. Uh, and that is um, everybody should understand that as far as we know, Bancroft Elementary is the only school in the city that has bilingual classrooms and special education classrooms in one classroom. So these are two things the Deputy Mayor for Education says that they value out of the boundary study. We're the only school that provides them in the same class. There are three classes of that in Bancroft, and it's one of the amazing and unique aspects of it. We have the expertise from our principal. We have the expertise and training of our teachers. And so to lose that because of, um, you know, a, a space squeeze uh, was something the DME correctly identified as something we should not even consider. Thank you. Um, what about the impact that the trailers would have on the field there? That's probably for Patricio. Where to start for Patricia and Moncia as well. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you my experience with it, both as a parent and as a community member. I coach kids from within and outside Bancroft every Thursday, including Omar's son, Adi. Um, and two days ago, actually, I was as I was playing, this maybe starts like a sad story, but a 15-year-old who plays there regular with other 15-year-olds who have seen move on from Bancroft but still go back to it hit me really hard in the head, broke my glasses. No. So we had an interaction there. And I'm telling you this just because of the interaction. And he's a Latino kid. We kick him over and said, I don't work. I can pay them, you know, for you. And I was like, it's fine. My kids play here with you. You know what you can do? Why don't you play with my kids and teach them a little bit? That interaction is unique to the soccer field. Erasing that would be bad for my kid in terms of that interaction with people who are older, different than him. But also... Those kids, just so you know, I think you even mentioned this. They're 15, 16 year olds who still go there when they could be on their phones, when they could be doing who knows whatever else, and still see Bancroft as the heart of their community. Now, this is this is just a perspective of a, of a parent enjoying this as a public space. 
I think yesterday you probably heard testimony from um, one of our neighbors, Mayor, who is uh, on a wheelchair and who finds this to be the only universally accept uh, accessible public space in the neighborhood. This is the only way she can actually play with her child, with their child. Um, and then the, the third piece, which I think maybe Monsavit can add to, is if you put the trailers there, this has strong implications for what happens inside. Already she talked about it. It's almost just like sheep coming in and out to the cafeteria to play. Now you don't even have to get outside. It's like you're crushing every, everyone inside because you can't even have the release valve of going outside for the kids. I think it's terrible not just for the kids, for me, for our little soccer team. It's everyone who suffers from this, the teachers primarily. Hope that helps. Yes, absolutely. Monse, did you want to add anything? Please. So, um, yes, can I do it in Spanish, please? Of course. Thank you. Pues sí, me gustaría añadir la perspectiva desde maestro. Eh, los estudiantes, los niños necesitan la, eh, el movimiento, el movimiento como parte del descanso. Necesitan la liberación de estar, después de estar todo el día sentado, aprendiendo, trabajando mentalmente, necesitan una liberación física para poder equilibrarse de nuevo y seguir aprendiendo. Si nosotros le quitamos el espacio para que se puedan liberar eh, y puedan re descargar toda esa energía, toda esa quietud que llevan en la clase durante todo el día, afectaría mucho, no solo académicamente, sino mental, en el desarrollo mental de un niño. Thank you very much. What ideas have been discussed as alternatives to trailers on the field? And have you received responses about whether they'd be feasible? Um, I guess I'll start with this and we'll see. Um, so uh, I, the first thing I will say is that the information that we have largely is sort of informal information. We haven't received any formal kind of description of the, you know, going to locations and looking into them. We get informal communications that, oh, maybe there's a little something happening here, maybe there. But then when we ask for more detail, um, there isn't any forthcoming from uh, the DC agencies. I will say that our communications with uh, DCPS have been uh, you know, more in a partnering way. Um, and I would say, you know, but then what, you know, at a certain point they say, well, this is a DGS matter. And when we reach out to DGS, we get no response. Yeah. And I'm sorry. And I, you know, and if, if I were new to this entirely, I would say, well, uh, this is just, I'm just a random person. They're not replying to me. But back when I was an advisory neighborhood commissioner in Petworth, and I had projects after project that I was trying to, I would have a partner agency in the partner agency, like DPR, uh, you know, uh, DCPS, they would be pretty great and responsive, right? They would come out to meetings, they would talk with us and so forth. And then it would get handed over to DGS and then the project would stall for a year, things would get blocked up, you would get no responses and so forth. Now, I understand there's some things around money that you know you need to be a little bit quieter about, but to you know, in my experience, and these are you know three or four projects, so not the whole thing, uh, DGS is just not a partner with communities in the way that other agencies are. So I just wanted to highlight that. And, and yeah, I can no, use I think you're right. whatever you help. Testimony they ultimately sent over was essentially we're waiting for the client agency to make a decision, which, yeah, I get it. I mean, in some ways I get it, but it's endlessly frustrating. Um, okay, so in the time that we have left, um, there are some folks who've um, working on the Rosemount project who have suggested there might be space there for pre-K, probably not as many spaces as needed, um, either in the building or trailers in the parking lot there. Are those options uh, attractive or something worth discussing? Uh, Omar, do you want to speak to this, maybe? You're, you're nodding. Yeah. So. Um, or Mark? I, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to jump in after Mark. Go ahead, Mark. I, 
I did go on a, a, a tour of, um, of the Rosemount space and, um, it, it would be a very attractive option for, um, as much as could be squeezed, uh, out of there because it's, uh, close it's, um, it's, uh, a very accessible space for pick up and drop off, you know, et cetera. So in some ways it's the most attractive option, but uh, the, the question then becomes expansion. So it doesn't, it doesn't serve the need by itself, but it is great interest. Yes. Yeah. And I would just add that as you will hear from a lot of the testimonies today, there's a lot of overlap between the communities from Rosemann and Bancroft. There's a lot of linkages that exist already. So there's um, something very attractive about using the Rosemount space to help offload some of the, um, the space requirements we have in the short term, if, if possible. I, I do think you highlight, Council Member Nadeau, the real question about is there enough space that it doesn't need to be addressed and, and answered adequately. But if it could work out, I think we would find that as an attractive option. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I just want to highlight something real quick. Um, it, a conversation about trailers at, on the uh, plague, um, sorry, at Rosemount. Uh, the issue, there's a challenge there because the trailers that were proposed for the soccer field were typically be for fifth graders. Um, and then they could use the shared spaces uh, at, um, at Bancroft, but those shared spaces are not available at Rosemount. So um, there are some challenges with that particular solution um, there that I just wanted to kind of highlight real quickly. Um, the question of putting pre-K kids in trailers is a little bit of a different challenge, I would say. Thank you. Actually, that's the first time that I had heard that. I thought we were just putting the babies in there. So that's very, very important information. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to this panel. I will um, turn back to our, our chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I want to, just for the record, how many classes do we need space for and how many kids would there be per class? Maybe, uh, Mark, do you want to address that real quick? Um, in the short term, we need six uh, classes in okay. 2025. And um, I mean, seven would would be nice. In the long term, uh, the uh, the need is going to be greater. Uh, you know, pre K is the six, but um, kindergarten, you know, will be included uh, if we have access to the Henderson Building or to a good long term solution, and you know, perhaps more. Okay, understand. And I just want to point out that Monse was nodding about as big as you can nod during that. And she, as a teacher, is the one who knows the most about this. Yes, I would like to add that for pre-K, we need seven class, uh, classes because uh, we have one special the special needs. And also in uh, currently in kinder, we have five classes but five classes of 25. So it would be better to have six classes of 20 instead of five of 25. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, if I may, just, just one little thing there, tying up together also the question about Rosemount, these types of questions to me refer to short-term release almost of the pressure, right? So with, when you ask a question about numbers in classrooms, it's like, I can tell you what happens today, but don't forget like the chart that Professor Jamie showed think bigger and think longer because we're going to find ourselves again at this point in five years or 10 years. So that's, that's why the annex is important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, while we were uh, in the hearing, we received testimony from DGS. Um, and <laughs> wonderful. I have uploaded it to the hearing management system and it's, it's not that long of a statement, but I want to give you all an opportunity to just respond to what, uh, and, and see if you were present for this. As it relates to Bancroft, uh, DGS stated that they participated, in a, they participated in a brief walkthrough of the Henderson building to determine if it would meet the programmatic needs of our client agency. Uh, my first question is, was anybody present for this programmatic walkthrough? No, this is something that happened uh, January 21st, and we learned about it only because a parent happened to be walking by and noticed there was a group of folks with shirts on. We have asked repeatedly, um, I know our ANCs have, I have, 
uh, and received literally either of, we got your message or I've received zero response. Okay. Understood. Um, I, I was wondering sort of how, when that took place and if, if you all had a, a chance to be part of it. Uh, there's sort of a summary statement that doesn't really include the reasoning, uh, but it says the buildings and site do not meet the needs for early childhood education programming for DCPS. Um, it then goes on to say there would be a significant cost to modernize the site based on the condition of the building and the level of changes that would be required. Additionally, the tight site and busy street would make the construction of the project difficult and would increase the overall cost. Wanted to give you an opportunity to respond to this. I mean, one thing I would say is that the busy street conversation check is literally across the street, same street. So, you know, DCPS doesn't have any problem strictly with that. I can't really speak to, you know, cost, construction costs, given the tight space, but we, we need we need an itemization of these points. We need it in detail. Uh, and, and, and the fact of the matter is that the DC government has done projects like military road project that was, you know, a complete run up for this sort of thing. And they did that one without huge upswell of public support that we have here. Uh, the Lafayette school wasn't even like really engaged at that point. So, so I think we need to take a harder look at this. Uh, we also here can guarantee like full attendance. I mean, we have clearly so much interest. And so it's not a question of filling the space once it's acquired. And the final thing is there's enough space to do more and to do more for those in need in the community. And, and I think that's something that we shouldn't lose track of. Um, you know. Great, um, I appreciate that. As it relates to Rosemount, uh, DGS says our role with respect to this legislation is limited in our mandate as an implementing agency, as what we talked about earlier already, to support the functions of our client agencies if sufficient funds are provided and it supports the desires of our client agency. DGS will negotiate for the purchase of this property. Is that similar to what you've what you've heard in the in your conversations thus far? We've heard absolutely nothing from. I, I haven't heard anything. No, from. I. We haven't heard yeah. anything either. So that that's like, that's very enlightening. It's good to know that they uh, said that they would participate so forthrightly. It's a very it's a very short statement, um, but just wanted to, and I've I've uploaded it for you all to see. But it it just came in, so I I just wanted I I, I actually love to for you all to be able to react to what is stated um, on on the record. Um, we did receive testimony from DME, um, uh, which was a written statement. Uh, there's uh, the one thing I wanted to weigh you weigh on then it says the purchase of a separate annex is a potential long term solution uh, that would require significant financial investment and potentially extensive renovation. This needs to be weighed against other capital investments we may make in the future. Yeah, yeah. If, if I can jump in, yep. Jamie, if you mind. So ahead, I, I I think that's right. And and Mark mentioned how um, su support of the DME has been through this process and have been a good partner in hearing us out. I think that they are saying something that reflects reality. I think the con construction costs and, and renovations that need to be conducted that uh, DGS mentioned are real. But the the headline for us is that the projections and long-term problem of overcrowding is not going to go away. It's only going to get worse. And Patricio, I think, made that point very, very clearly and, and concretely. And if the investments we need to make now are for a long-term solution. So we're not back here again. I, it's, I think it's surprising how we're having this conversation sh so shortly after Bancroft went through a renovation and we don't we don't want to do that as a community. That's and I'm sure you all want to hear from us again as a community. So I actually think that the fact that it's a long term solution that requires a very intentional rebuild of the interior of the, of the building is actually the right approach to make sure that we are um, setting Bancroft up for success in, in, in the long term. Understood. Thank you. Um, get opportunity. Any did anybody else want to respond or add anything else for the record at this time? Just just to add to la Omar's last point, I think Jamie touched on it, and specifically the Henderson building. The, the group here and other members of the community did help the DME do an extensive due diligence around properties that could be purchased, and just double tap or highlight the fact that this is the opportunity for this particular building in the neighborhood, less than a mile away from Bancroft, is unique. I don't think it's going to come up again. 
and it happens to be, according to our real estate advisors of the neighborhood, very underpriced. So in addition to what Omar said, it's a unique opportunity. You could solve the problem now at a less cost than it could be at any other point. Absolutely. I agree. Yes. Me gustaría añadir algo. Ay, un segundo. Se me ha cambiado. Te me vemos y te escuchamos. Me gustaría añadir. Oh. Sí, es que me viene el sonido. Bueno, el... me gustaría añadir que sí, estamos muy enfocados y es muy importante. El dinero, recursos pero y el impacto que tienen los estudiantes en el desarrollo del futuro de estos estudiantes me suena que no me entonces ahora sí eh, me gustaría que también estuviésemos muy presente cómo nuestras decisiones van a afectar a nuestros estudiantes al desarrollo no solamente cognitivo, sino a la salud mental de nuestros estudiantes. Al pasar tanto tiempo condensado en un espacio tan reducido, sí, en un espacio tan reducido y sin poder, eh, si tenemos los trainers, sin poder liberarnos. Ese desarrollo, ya en, en, todos sabemos lo que hemos pasado durante los años de pandemia, el, las consecuencias que hemos vivido, volver a estar encerrados en un espacio tan reducido eh, puede impactar mucho en el desarrollo, no solo emocional, sino también en el aprendizaje académico de nuestros estudiantes. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you to this entire panel. Uh, we will now move to our second panel um, and we'll be in touch with follow-up questions um, as we move this process along uh, in the midst of budget season. Uh, next up, we have Vernon Kelly, uh, board chair, Rosemount Center, who is present with us. Uh, Dr. Janet Stocks, senior program officer, Rosemount Center. Erica Nunez, Commissioner ANC 1D03. Amanda Nojic, Parent Rosemount Center. Uh, and Marilyn Hernandez, Parent Rosemount Center. Don't forget we're keeping Jamie on. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Kelly. Thank you for being here with us uh, in person and you may begin your testimony. Good morning. Uh, uh, thank you, Councilmember Lewis George, for um, expediting the this hearing, and our thanks, of course, to uh, Councilmember Nadeau for ushering in the legislation um, to to bring us uh, to this, uh, this point as well. Um, so uh, my testimony is, uh, had, I've submitted it for the record, but I just wanted to add uh, a couple of other uh, pieces of information uh, just surrounding the Rosemont Center. Uh, one, uh, the Rosemont Center is really a model for dual language early childhood education programs. Uh, it's a model that should be expanded across the city. Uh, we believe that it has much to offer for all of the se eight, seven wards of the city in terms of how to run a program successfully. And uh, it's a stable, financially, it, it's very stable and uh, it's uh, been run uh, very uh, conservatively uh, through the years. and. Um, we think it has a lot to offer 
not only the Mount Pleasant community, but other communities throughout the city. Um, so today, uh, I, as I come before you as a representative of the Rosemont Center, uh, but also as a, a humble voice for the countless families whose lives have been touched by our 50 years of legacy of excellence in dual language, early childhood education and development. For half a century, Rosemont has been more than just a center. It's been a sanctuary where over 10,000 uh, children have embarked on their educational journey, armed with the critical Head Start Foundation that is the bedrock of their social and academic growth. Uh, as the capital city of our nation, it is, I believe, incumbent upon us to lead by example, uh, to illuminate the path forward for programs such as uh, Rosemont's dual language, early childhood education program, not just throughout our city, but across the country. And as we know, study after study affirms what we know in our hearts, that investing in the formative years of a child's life, ages three to five, is the most powerful tool that we have in shaping their futures uh, and their success. And here at Rosemont, um, despite our unwavering dedication to many of the communities, three, four, and five-year-olds, we unfortunately find ourselves facing an existential threat. Uh, the specter of the lease termination looms over us, threatening to disrupt the stability of our community. And for our devoted 60 staff, uh, and teachers, the 163 families who rely on the Rosemont Center and the additional 77 families uh, that are served through our home-based program, which in fact reaches all seven wards, the closure of our doors would not just be a loss, it would be a seismic disruption. Uh, we cannot and we must not fail the children uh, Mayor Bowser has eloquently articulated the critical role that early childhood education plays in shaping the trajectory of a child's life. To quote Mayor Bowser, our promise to district families to support our youngest learners with the highest caliber of joyful learning. Uh, that is in essence what Rosemont is about. Um, so therefore, I surmise if we truly understand the importance of this mission, supporting early childhood education, then we are, as a community, inclusive of our council members, our mayor, and corporate powers, duty-bound to do everything in our power to ensure its success. If we, as a collective community, know better, then we must do better. We must do better at prioritizing funding for dual language early childhood education. We must do better at providing the resources necessary to nurture the minds and the hearts of our youngest learners. We must do better at ensuring that our early childhood educators are compensated fairly for their invaluable contributions. We must do better at fostering public private partnerships aimed toward collaboration and sharing our successes across every corner of our great city. But most importantly, it means recognizing that the future of our city indeed does rest in the hands of these three, four, and five-year-olds that are in these programs. We all, all of DC, have the power to shape the future, to provide these children with the tools they need to thrive and succeed, but we cannot do it alone. So I urge you from the depths of my heart to stand with us uh, stand with Rosemont Center, 
stand with these children and their families and our staff, stand with the future of our city. Together, let us ensure that every child, regardless of circumstance, has the opportunity to reach their full potential. And thank you for your unwavering commitment to the children of our city. Thank you so much for your testimony and please remain here because we'll have some questions at the end. Yes. Uh, next, we will hear from Dr. Janet Stocks, Senior Program Officer, Rosemount Center. Uh, good morning, uh, Ms. Stocks and, and welcome. Thank you, Council Member Lewis George, um, and thank you for the speedy scheduling of this hearing. I'm a resident of Ward 4, and I really appreciate your leadership. I read your newsletter every Friday afternoon, and I appreciate all the communication that you um, that you do. Um, time is of the essence, and we're working hard to save Rosemont, which has been an important community institution for over 50 years. I also want to thank Council Member Nadeau for introducing this legislation and Chair Mendelson for his support. Rosemont is proud of its excellent reputation for improving the lives of children and families through a unique bilingual and economically diverse model. Approximately 60% of the families we serve are at or below the federal poverty line and qualify for federal Head Start or early Head Start funding. Mm -hmm. Many of these families are immigrants and many are Spanish speaking. Another 20% qualify for Aussie subsidies, which pay a portion of the tuition. And then we also have about 20% of families paying full tuition, which is approximately $2,000 a month. I'm a sociologist, and I know that the diversity that children experience at Rosemont provides a strong foundation for all children. As we say, Rosemont is a great place to start. Since we announced our current situation with the building lease, we have heard so many stories from families whose children went to Rosemont, some of whom, who, whom are now bringing their children to Rosemont, and the lifelong impacts from the strong start they received at Rosemont. Children from primarily English-speaking families who are still fluent in Spanish 20 years later, an immigration judge who learned her empathy for immigrants from the, her strong start at Rosemont, children from mostly Spanish-speaking families who were well-prepared for success in school because of the strong start they received at Rosemont. We understand that the amazing lease agreement that we had for so many years with the House of Mercy is no longer sustainable. At the same time, it has been difficult for us to figure out how to jump from that arrangement, which was $1 a year, when our budget is already very tight, to be able to pay market rate rent or to carry a mortgage. It is clear that a solution will require us to be creative and work with several organizations to patchwork together a solution. To that end, we have had extensive conversations with the Office of Head Start about the support they could offer, which could include a one-time grant to help with the purchase of the building. Because of our mixed economic model, they would at most be able to offer a grant that is proportional to the number of children we serve with Head Start and Early Head Start funds. Parents in the community who value Rosemont, not just an early, as an early childhood center, but as an institution that has been central to the multicultural community in Mount Pleasant, have offered to su substantially help with the capital campaign. If we could secure a multi-year lease with the city to use Rosemont classrooms to help relieve the overcrowding at, Bank at Bancroft, or if the city could help with the purchase of the building or buy it outright, that would be another piece of the puzzle. Rosemont has seven classrooms on the second floor that are currently used for pre-K classes. We would ideally like to maintain the 24 spots that we have for Head Start families. That would leave at least five classrooms that could be used as Bancroft overflow space. We also have parking lot space that could potentially be used for a trailer or two. We understand the city's budget is tight. We are concerned, for instance, about the city's ability to continue to support the Early Childhood Educators Pay Equity Fund. We know that it is unlikely that the city will be in a position to buy the building outright, but it would be an incredible help to us if the city could play a part in saving this valuable institution and preserve the child care spots that we have, the supports that we give to many families, and the livelihood of our 60 teachers and staff. A long-term lease agreement with the city could help accomplish this. Thank you for your time. Please let me know if there are any other information that we can provide to support this legislation. Thank you so much. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Commissioner 
Erica Nunes, ANC 1D03. Commissioner, good morning, and thank you for being here with us. Good morning, and thank you to the committee for allowing me to testify today. My name is Erica Nunez, and I serve as the Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner representing ANC 1D03, which is fortunate enough to include both the Rosemount Center and Bancroft Elementary within its boundaries. So I'm speaking today in that capacity to express my community's strong support for the bill under discussion today and to underscore that the residents of my district are fully united in preserving our bilingual early childhood education opportunities. So as you've heard today, both the Rosemount Center and Bancroft Elementary are model examples of bilingual early childhood education and they're pillars of the DC Hispanic community, which are just two things that we don't want to see fall through the cracks during a tight budget season. And the theme of today has been turning challenges into moments of opportunity and that time is of the essence. So I'd like to focus my testimony on spotlighting the short, hard-earned window of opportunity that we're in to preserve the Rosemount Center's services at its current location, because I firmly believe that saving the Rosemount Center is not only achievable, but it's just absolutely necessary for this community's well-being because of its unique services and position. So it's a time-sensitive issue, and I really appreciate all the work that's uh, been done so far to make this hearing happen today while action can still be taken. So as people were describing, the Rosemont Center supports hundreds of children from all over the city through Head Start funding childcare subsidies. And just any disruption to Rosemont services creates a destabilizing gap in education and support systems and just disproportionately affects families that are already struggling to access affordable childcare. And those free and subsidized services are truly a lifeline. So. Just for that reason, it's important to emphasize that saving Rosemount is not just an aspiration. For a limited time, it's a feasible and solvable challenge. And as such, we just have a responsibility to pursue the options on the table to keep these services running. So members of the committee, I'd like to discuss some opportunities that might brighten, hopefully, the financial outlook that you're assessing while you weigh the hurdles, costs, and benefits of investing in bilingual ECEs. Um, Rosemount status as a model Head Start program has helped the staff have really positive discussions with the Office of Head Start regarding potential grants that could significantly reduce financial hurdles at this stage. They can obviously speak best to the details on that, but it's something to underscore. Uh, then further to the point of reducing budget constraints, uh, if the city cannot purchase the building, a lease agreement could still be highly beneficial. And really, it's the continuity of services that is key here. So exploring the lease arrangements that could help Rosemount's early childhood services stay afloat, uh, as was alluded to earlier, could potentially also alleviate some of Bancroft's overcrowding in the short term as they pursue long-term solutions like the Henderson building. And as the committee, as you're considering the matter of providing essential services to the children and families of this city, uh, I could not overstate the benefit that you have before you here in the engaged, organized, and supportive Rosemount community. Uh, the Rosemount community has shown unyielding collaborative engagement since learning of the Rosemount Center's imminent closure two months ago, and it's composed of hundreds of uh, actively involved parents, alumni, teachers, business owners, and just concerned residents who are ready and committed to support this effort, whether it's through events, fundraising, crowdsourcing, pro bono services, uh, whatever is constructive, helpful, or needed, this community has really shown up and we should be so lucky to work with such engaged citizens who care so deeply about our children's futures. So as I've discussed this issue with members of my district, so many people have shared personal testimonials highlighting the Rosemount Center's irreplaceable role in their lives, from parents who found a safe place to raise their kids in a shared language, to kids who learn how to bridge, you know, cultural differences at an early age. The I just I guess I want to emphasize that the diverse coalition that's advocating for Rosemount's preservation is 
this really, it really beautifully reflects the fabric of Washington, D.C. And I really found it to be an inspiring example of surpassing one of D.C.'s greatest struggles to truly integrate families across the economic spectrum and across different racial and ethnic backgrounds into one community. And what I hear time and time again from so many people is that it's just a testament specifically to the unique environment that Rosemount can cultivate. So despite having this, despite being lucky enough to have this engaged community, and I know that I'm running low on time, so sorry, uh, making sure that the families and children of our city have access to affordable bilingual ECEs is really a priority that the city should lead on because they're critical to helping children and families close those opportunity gaps. They help children gain cross-cultural communication understanding. And it's just a superpower that our city really needs more of. And so many people are grateful to see that leadership exemplified in this bill and hope to see it move forward. So thank you so much. I'll give back the time. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will hear from Amanda Nogic, Parent Rosemount Center. Good morning, Council Member Lewis George. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today in support of this bill. And thank you to Council Member Nadeau for her steadfast work on this issue in our Mount Pleasant community. I'm here today as a parent <clears throat> of two children who attend Rosemount and as part of a group of parents and community members committed to save Rosemount a small part of a large community of folks who have seen firsthand the crucial positive impact that Rosemont has had on their children's lives. For the past two months since we've learned about Rosemont's possible closure due to the lease ending, we've been doing everything we can to keep Rosemont open. The primary concern for us was ensuring continuity for the most vulnerable children that Rosemont serves. Approximately 58% of the 240 children qualify for early Head Start or Head Start funding, an additional 20% of students receive childcare subsidy from the city. For me, this is a very personal issue as I attended a Head Start Center as a child, and I know how critical it is to provide children from all walks of life with a safe space to be kids, to be met with care, and to learn. Our group's efforts resulted in a meeting with the owner of the building, a nonprofit called the House of Mercy, who said they were willing to work on a lease to purchase of the facility to Rosemont Center, the school itself. This is described in the testimony Mr. Marsteller submitted uh, yesterday. We knew time was tight given Rosemount's still outstanding need to apply for Head Start funding by mid-April, but we worked to put together information on a potential capital stack for purchase as identified in my written testimony. This would include contributions from the city to make it work. Ultimately, as parents and community members, we have no control over whether Rosemont chooses to purchase the building or not, but wanted to provide everything we could think of in support. Um, as of today, it is still maddeningly unclear to the community whether Rosemont has decided to lease the building for future purchase or not. The Rosemont Board and leadership has stated publicly that they are considering it, but have not updated us on their efforts, even with Mr. Kelly stating here today that they are financially stable. At this point, I believe Rosemont's potential closure will be due to a failure of will and of imagination by the Rosemont Board and senior leaders. However, you know, the clock keeps ticking and someone, anyone needs to act. When I talk about saving Rosemont, I want to be clear that I am talking about working to keep the core heart of Rosemont open to ensure our wonderful teachers and amazing staff can continue to do their high quality work. The school part of the school is incredible and should continue to operate. But I believe the city should also have a role in ensuring there is access, availability, and affordability of early childhood education. At this point, I believe the best option to be the city, the city entering into a lease agreement for the property if a purchase is not possible. That will give time for the community to continue to work with and to be quite honest, apply pressure to Rosemount Board and leadership. It will keep our selfless teachers employed and it will keep these critical Head Start spaces available. But if a city hall lease for the operation of Rosemount only is not feasible, it seems possible to solve two issues here and lease the property for the dual use of Bancroft Pre-K and Rosemount Infant and Toddler Early Childhood Services as Dr. Stocks described. This solution would net out to a decrease in pre-K slots in the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. Certainly not ideal, but it is certainly better than both losing these critical Head Start services and reducing the only outdoor field space at Bancroft by putting trailers on it for temporary classroom use. The city has a chance to build upon a model established at the Stevens Early Learning Center and future efforts underway to incorporate childcare services into Truesdale and Wheatley Elementary's post-renovation. The city is already moving toward this model. We just need to put the pieces together here to make it happen. Um, even the city leasing on a more short-term basis, perhaps say five or 10 years, to provide a relief valve from the overcrowding at Bancroft through what may be an early childhood demographic bubble 
while ensuring Rosemac can continue to provide these Head Start services would be an absolute win. We just have to get a little creative, but the pieces are there. There is impending deadlines, including the need for Rosemount Center to apply for their Head Start funding to continue to receive that subsidy. I know that Rosemount staff and teachers are more than capable and motivated to keep providing these services. Someone just needs to provide them the opportunity to do so through a building lease or purchase. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from Marilyn Hernandez, a parent at Rosemount Center. Uh, good morning, Marilyn. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to be here uh, to testify. Um, dear council member of the District of Columbia, I'm Marine Hernandez Loza, a parent and president of the Policy Council, stand before you today, not only as a concerned parent, but also as a speed fest advocate for the unvalued institution of Rosemont Center. My connection to this remarkable center spans 15 years a journey that commenced in 2010 when I first walked through this door with wide-eyed anticipation and continue to this day as my current child embarks on their educational voyage here in 2020. For over a decade and a half, Rosemont has been more than just a school. It's been a second home, a sanctuary of learning, growth, and nurturing for countless families like mine. One of Rosemont's hallmarks home, resonates with me is their commitment to family engagement. They ensure active parental involvement in child, children's education, fostering a young learner's holistic growth and development. During COVID-19, I was a healthcare worker and had no option to stay at home with my daughter. While other early childhood centers were closed due to the impact of COVID-19, Rosemont was there to ensure that my daughter would be well taken care of in a learning environment. Just like me, more family members find themselves in similar situations where Rosemont is there to help family members. With a heavy heart and a sense of profound distress, I contemplate the possibility of Rosemont Center ceasing to exist. The thought of his door close, um, closing fills me with a profound sense of loss, not only for my own family, but for those, um, for the countless others who have benefited from this unique dedication to early childhood education. The effect of Rosemont closing would be huge, reaching far beyond this meeting room and affecting everyone in our community. As we gather here today, let us remember Wilson Center's vital role in shaping our children's mind and future. So let us stand together to work and find a resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we are going to have a 10 minute round of questions, and I'm going to again start with uh, my colleague, Councilman Brianna Doe, for a 10 minute round. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you, for your testimony. Um, I want to start. I'm going. I actually mostly have questions for our folks at um, our Rosemount team, um, and probably more specifically, Mr. Kelly. Um, Mr. Kelly, can you clarify? Is Rosemount intending to extend the lease with House of Mercy for one year so that we can work out the rest of this? Uh Frankly, I I don't know if we're able to extend have the lease extended. That's the decision on the half on behalf of the landlord. I'll stop you. House of Mercy included in their testimony today. It, they indicated they are happy to extend the lease for a year, regardless of any purchase agreement. Well, the I'm sorry. The the last that we heard from House of Mercy it was that a lease extension was possible only as it applied to the purchase of the property. That's what I'd heard too, so I was surprised by their written testimony. So this is news to you as well? Yes, it is. Okay, so given that information, would Rosemount be interested in extending the lease for a year if it does not, if it's not contingent on a purchase agreement? Well, of course, that, I mean, personally, I, I think that would be, you know, something that would, definitely be of interest. Uh, I can't speak for the entire board and our organization. Uh, we would certainly um, look at that if that is actually the case. And if that's accurate, uh, we would be more than willing to uh, review that option. Great. We'll send you a copy of the testimony received by the committee today. It indicated that 
um, they had presented Rosemount with an offer to extend the lease for one year for $500,000 along with an option, but not an obligation to purchase the property after that year. So it does sound like that information is a little new to all of us here, but also very encouraging um, because, of course, everybody needs to know what's going to happen with Head Start and whether or not parents need to find another place for their kids for this upcoming school year. Um, so let us get that to you as soon as possible. It just, is the board in a position to move quickly around that offer? Uh, yes, I would think so. We uh, we could call an emergency board meeting. Great. Thank you. And um, do you have an estimate of how many teachers and students will be displaced if Rosemount closes? I know Ms. Stocks may, may need to pitch in on some of this, too. Uh, yeah, so we have approximately 60 uh, teachers, uh, between teachers and staff um, right now, and that, you know, that figure can change. But uh, yes, in terms of teachers and staff, it's about 60. And how many students? Uh, students, uh, about 160. It would be all, all of our students, which is um, 240, because we, we wouldn't, if we don't have a location, we can't really continue our home based program either because we need to have a central location for that. So even our home based um, families would be affected if we if we close down. Yes, that's correct. So, so it's a total of about 240 children and 60 <laughs> staff members. What is Rosemount doing to support the families and teachers who will need to make a transition if the center closes? So. We have thought about what we could do to support the teachers um, and the staff and the families. We've given the families some information. I think we're in this very uncomfortable um, situation right now where we don't know what's going on. And so it's hard to know where to focus our efforts. Um, I personally have been focusing my efforts on uh, working with the community um, with, um, and trying to do what we can to support um, the community and and to move forward and to come up with creative solutions uh, to the problems that we're facing. Um, no, no. Um, as far as I know, anyway, no big decisions have been made by the board or the CEO and COO about how to move forward. And so all the rest of us are kind of in limbo that's how and, and so it's a very uncomfortable feeling so that's once what it we, feels like yeah so once we know what we're going to be doing then we can focus our efforts and we do have lots of plans for how we would support the teachers of course it breaks our heart to think about doing that so um you know we we're doing what we can to um to be supportive of the teachers in this uncomfortable limbo situation that we're in i'm sorry to say that i don't have a better answer for it. That's okay. We can leave it there for now. Um, I, I think it's it's this sense of urgency, really. You know, everything's on hold until we know what's going to happen next. So um, what sort of support is Rosemount looking for from the district government? I know, Mr. Kelly, you said the finance committee was going to be meeting this week. Is there any more insight into how much funding you think is needed? Well, I, I can't give a, a specific dollar amount, but I can say we would need something in the order of six figures. Um, the Rosemont financially, uh, we're we're solid in terms of how we run our operation. Uh, we rarely had uh, to run deficits. Uh, but we also don't have any major kind of surpluses. So um, in order to take on a mortgage of the magnitude that was proposed in the, uh, the, the letter that was um, submitted to us after the parents group meeting um, would essentially mean that we would have to significantly cut our services uh, to the community. Uh, we would run deficits, um, running more than a million dollar deficits a year for whatever term, uh, at least five years, you know, for a mortgage. Um, so our, our ask of the city is to uh, step up in a big way 
um, in a significant way and in a sustainable way. Um, and I would imagine um, just a, a quick uh, look back over the over the our deliberations over the past few weeks. Um, we would be talking, you know, something north of a million dollars. From so, the district? From the district, right. Okay. So seven figures then? At seven figures, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say six figures. Okay. <laughs> letting, off, letting us off easy. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's helpful. Thank you. And I know that, you know, like we're still working that out, but it gives us sort of a ballpark north of a million. Okay. Um, let's see. Council member, if I could just jump in while you're looking. Go ahead, Amanda. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, I think that, you know, what is critical now is we just need more time. The money can yeah. be made available. There's tons of grants. There's a Head Start Facilities grant, which could, you know, contribute up to 58% of the building purchase. Um, what we just need is time and we need this lease to be extended. We need Rosemount to get their act together, to be quite honest, and lease the building for another year. Um, I know there's already a lot of community support. There's been a family who's um, offered to contribute um, $100,000 in matching funds um, in terms of fundraising. Um, we can get this done. We just need to put the pieces together. Great. I like that. Um, and I was going to ask that... Um, how we leverage all this, all the support that exists, especially in light of, you know, the new information from House of Mercy, it seems like the community is organized enough that we can pull in other funds. District funds have to be part of it. Um, and I think, you know, we've got some good support at the council for that, but um, hopefully this buys us time. So, um, I, I'm, I've asked my colleague to send the testimony from House of Mercy over to Mr. Kelly right away um, so that they can see that. That's also, um, if it's not yet uploaded, will be on um, the page for this hearing on the council website so everyone can see all the testimony that's been uploaded today. Um, so that that's really helpful. And does anything, we kind of, I think we went through a bunch of my questions with that one answer recently. Is there anything else anyone wants to add before I turn back to my colleague? Um, yes, I, I would just like to say, uh, you know, Rosemont, uh, the, the institution, the leadership, the board, uh, we do have our act together. Uh, we are working diligently to uh, make the best decision as stewards of the of the institution that we run. We have a responsibility not only to the community, but to our staff, our teachers. Uh, we have an immense amount of data and information that we need to vet and, and be able to analyze in order to make a, a firm decision. Uh, the, the owners of the property have to be willing to, um, you know, work with us and, um, you know, in the end, it's a, it's a decision of the ownership of the building, uh, no matter what we want to do, uh, for quite some time, we had, uh, reached out to the, to the owners of the property to see how we could resolve the issue um, with little or no um, response, you know, from that team. So it, it made it very difficult um, to, to resolve the issue. Absolutely, I understand. And sometimes public involvement can change the conversation. So here we are today, perhaps the hearing was even a catalyst for that change of, of their offer. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming together. Um, Mr. Kelly, we'll follow up, and I would love to come and meet and talk with the board um, soon about their plans so I can hear more about how I can support and how the district government can support. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I just want to get some things on the record. How much will it cost to buy the property from House of Mercy? Um, the information that they said uh, 
or that they presented was that the, they estimated the market value between eight million and twelve million dollars. Okay. Okay. Um, and does anybody else have any information in regards to that? Yeah. Um. This is Amanda. And uh, um, I was at the meeting. That is accurate. And to be fair to Mr. Kelly and Rosemount, too, um, you know, we received that information on March 13th. They have had to act very quickly um, to try to put this together, which is why we really also tried to put things together very quickly, um, realizing it's a tight timeline. But to be quite honest, um, you know, I think it is a, you know, a, a, a totally solvable problem with the um, funding that could be possibly available through Head Start grants fundraising um, a very small mortgage. Got it. And uh, we've heard a lot today about time is a big factor. What deadlines are we facing as it relates to sort of what deadline is House of Mercy given Rosemount by when they need to make an offer? Um, what deadlines are we facing so that we can be aware as far as how swiftly we need to be moving on this end? Um, I believe the original uh, letter that we received from House of Mercy asked for um, 31st of March deadline to submit an offer to purchase the property, which was totally not feasible okay. because we were not able to complete all our due diligence within that time frame. So we, our attorney is working on um, some documentation Sorry. at this point. So, you know, that's, that's the only um, information that I have this far. Got it. Um, I was going to do the same thing I did with the last, uh, just for you to be able to respond. The section of DGS, a uh, very limited testimony that we received today, um, noted, as I'll state again, our role with respect to this legislation is limited on our mandate as an implementing agency to support the functions of our client agency. If sufficient funds are provided and it supports the desires of our client agency, DGS will negotiate for the purchase of this property. Um, just wanted to ask, has anybody had any uh, conversations at all uh, with, uh, I, I mean, I guess who's the client agency at this? <laughs> I don't know. Who is the client agency? Aussie? I, I'm confused. Maybe DME. We're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, maybe DME is a client agency. Maybe Aussie. I don't know. I know there have been conversations with DME. Actually, the last panel, they stated there had been conversation with DME. And DME has did submit testimony yesterday and, and has been a willing partner. So I, I'm I'm guessing that DME may be that, that part. But just wanted to ask the panel if any of them had had any conversations, I guess, with the Deputy Mayor's Office of Education or the Office of the State Superintendent of Education. Um, I know the parent group has reached out to multiple uh, members of the government regarding the um, the issue. I'm not, I know we've reached out to the Deputy Mayor of Education. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight, um, and as far as deadlines, um, I think Janet could speak more clearly to this, but uh, the, I think the Head Start grant has an April 15th deadline. So we're really um, right up against the clock here. Yeah, that's true. We have an April 15th deadline for, um, we are we are working on preparing that grant though, because we don't want to miss the deadline. So I think we're, we're probably going to submit the grant. I think we're going to submit the grant not knowing what the building situation is. We have been very in touch with Head Start, so they are completely aware of our situation. We have also been in touch with Aussie, and they're very aware of our situation as well. We have been talking with the Deputy Mayor, Mayor of Education Office for about six months about this situation, so they are well informed about the situation as well. Okay, great. Um... And what what's the what's the can you send me the information for the grant just so I I can have the information and inquire with thank you I appreciate that the information about the Head Start the possible right. Head Start grant is that what you're asking yes yeah. I can I can send so you some formulate it, you know with the the language yeah um, to inquire where we are on that um, we're I mean we're having a large conversation right now as a city as you know around early childhood education um, and it's almost just sort of it's crazy that. We, you all have been doing this advocacy and this work and having this conversation. Um, and then we're at a point in budget where we all know the early education pay equity fund uh, that, that Councilmember Nadeau and I fought for through the Hearts and Homes Amendment and Councilmember Allen uh, is, is under attack at this moment. 
I just want to give everybody an opportunity to just respond to why this is so important for your neighborhood, your community, and your families. Um, and then if, uh, as far as, you know, and, and I believe um, the teacher on the last panel, um, Ms. Fernandez, did an amazing job really talking about why, how this impacts the student's development emotionally, cognitively, et cetera. Um, but just want to, you know, give you an opportunity to talk about why this is so important um, for your community, for your families, and why our early childhood educators are also is, is are as important and integral for you all um, uh, in, in this program. Janet, you, you want to? Well, I mean, I'm going to speak as a sociologist, which is um, there has been a lot of uh, research done on the benefits of early childhood education and the long term benefits and the return on investment for uh, early childhood education, which are many times the amount that is invested. So, um, I, I mean, and and for me, it's not just the families we serve, but the families who are, benefit from um, employment by Rosemont. And it, it just would be a lot of people who would be, who would lose. And, he, and here's something I've learned since we went public and, and the parents um, have gotten as involved as they are this institution is not just an early childhood center. There are people who who are involved with this effort whose kids graduated from Rosemont 20 years ago. Um, this this institution has helped form a community that is diverse. Um, you know, we're, we are always talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I think we are an institution that has supported that, and it and it ripples out from our building into the local community. And I, and I think the loss of that would be, would be felt by the community for sure. And, and Janet, you could probably speak to the impact of, on the teachers in terms of the uh, pay equity issue with the teachers. That's another thing that will impact our budget. You know, I, we really, really appreciate the work that um, Janice and um, and everyone has done to support our teachers in the Pay Equity Act. And, it, and it's heartbreaking to think that it might go away. And we are hoping that you will continue to fight for it. But, um, you know, teachers are, this this work doesn't pay very much for any of the staff members of, of Rosemont. And so any kind of support that we can get to help make that more equitable is extremely important. Um, I can also speak as a parent in terms of the the teachers themselves, um, you know, doing this work, we've learned a lot about the school. I've only been there since 2022, but some of the teachers have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, um, which is incredible in an early childhood setting. You know, that's just not common. It just really speaks to the community that Rosemount um, builds and supports. Um, some of the teachers, you know, started out with their kids going to school there and then they became teachers themselves. Um, I've heard from teachers who, you know, a lot of the teachers are immigrant women and they've come to this country and they don't have family here and they have made Rosemount their home. I know of one person who, um, you know, has been here for 20 years and 19 of them she spent at Rosemount. Um, I I cannot emphasize enough how passionate and, and supportive and skilled these teachers are at their jobs and what they do to promote these children's well-being. Um, you know, and I think it's really important as we think about the children who Rosemount serve. Um, you know, it's important for children who maybe also have just immigrated here, or their families have just come here to be taught and to be supported by people that look like them and have the same backgrounds as them. Um, I know that as a, you know, I was a Head Start student when I was little, and it just was really helpful to be in a place where you felt safe and loved and cared for and understood. And that's what I think is really, really the crucial part of Rosemont here is that, you know, they're not just providers of child care and education, it's it's a home, it's a community, and, and we need to have it exist. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you all for, for being on this panel and for your advocacy. Um, and uh, we will um, be following up as we move through this process. Um, we, uh, the government witnesses for today, uh, is the Department of General Services uh, and the Deputy Mayor of Education. Um, the DGS hearing will be on Monday in which we will have a dedicated section on at, at Monday's oversight hearing, uh, which is here 
uh, in person, will be here in person and virtual uh, on Monday with the director of Department of General Services, Delano Hunter. Uh, and so those, we will be addressing questions to him regarding this on Monday. Uh, the DME uh, uh, hearing is today um, in room 412. The council community whole has this hearing on the budget uh, for them. People can submit testimony related to DME today through next week uh, using the council's hearing management system. Um, and I'm going to try to make it over at some point to DME today um, just to make sure I can get questions on the record regarding this uh, with the Deputy Mayor of Education while also doing DGS public witness hearing for myself today. Um, so thank you so much to this panel um, and thank you to Councilmember Nadeau. Um, and we have a lot of work to do, but this was really meaningful and helpful uh, and we have to move quickly and swiftly. And so uh, uh, those conversations will be happening uh, throughout this time. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Um, just some reminders uh, as we end. Thank you to our panel of witnesses. Um, as a reminder for this public related to this hearing, if you'd like to submit written testimony uh, for the record, please do so by 5 p.m. on Friday, April 12th by uploading it to the council's hearing management system. Um, this concludes today's public hearing on B25694. Uh, we will reconvene later today for the public witness portion of DGS fiscal year 2025 budget hearing, uh, and we will play, plan to start that hearing at noon today. Uh, we also have the government witness portion of DGS fiscal year 2025 budget hearing on Monday, April 8th. Um, the time is now 11.15 a.m. and this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you.